the next few years was the receiving the um, ICTP Ramanujan Prize. So this prize is a mathematics prize awarded annually by the ICTP, that is the International Center for Theoretical Physics in Italy. This prize, prize was named after the Indian mathematician Srinivasa Ramanujan, and it was founded in 2004. And uh, uh, Dr. Sujala Ram became the first Indian to receive this prestigious prize in 2006. And I uh, was just looking at it in the last uh, uh, last uh, five, eight years, since 2015, actually three Indians have awarded, uh, been awarded this prize. So I'm happy to know that the mathematics community in India is growing and also being recognized. Um, she was also awarded the Shanti Surya Bhatnagar Award, the highest honor in scientific fields by the Indian government in 2004. Recently, uh, the, the Krigan Nelson There are many of them, just to, uh, uh, to uh, mention a few. In the International Science Academy Young Scientist Award in 1993, uh, Alexander Von Humboldt Fellow, 1970 to Fellow of the Indian Academy of Science, 2004, Fellow of the National Academy of Science in India, 2005, the Vaidyanath Swami Visiting Chair Professor in the Chennai Mathematical Institute, 2008 to 2011. A Jing faculty, I said Pune, fellow of the Indian National Science Academy in 2009. She is a member of the Scientific Committee in the French Center for Promotion of Science. She is a member of the Scientific Committee of the SIMPA, the International Center for Pure and Applied Mathematics. Uh, uh, Dr. Andre uh, initially worked on the areas of algebraic theory of quadratic forms and arithmetic geometry of ellipt e elliptic curves. And together, with, together with many other uh, mathematicians, she formulated a non commutative version of the main conjecture of Ivasava theory on which much foundation of this important subject is based. So, um, the, uh, uh, I met Dr. Sujata Andre in uh, the Kavli uh, Frontiers of Science Symposium. Uh, which was uh, held uh, literally the, as part of the Indo-US uh, partnership in 2008. And uh, this was an interdisciplinary conference which had um, all aspects of uh, STEM, mathematics, uh, astrophysics, neuro neuroscience, I think medicine, various things were there in that. So it was, uh, uh, we have been meeting um, once in a while in various forums, etc. Throwing light upon the connections, uh, I mean, and you can uh, read about her views on uh, math, art, and etc. So she feels that they're all interconnected, and the component of mathematics, which is pure uh, art as well, because uh, it connects everything. And then it's like you know, putting uh, something in math, and some if you bring it together, it's like art. So it's like crafting and planning a symphony. So if you listen to her uh, view of how the art and everything brings together. I hope that she will look at it uh, uh, and throw some light on today's talk as well. So it's basically looking at how things get integrated rather than looking at in pieces. So uh, she is articulated in the talks as well as talks as well as interviews. interviews. Um, um, also, I learned also that, that she that strongly believes in transforming and transforming learning of mathematics in the classroom in a way that encourages students to develop more interest in it. It is very profoundly thought, so I thought I should, I should share it here. So she says, we don't have to make it competitive. Make it cooperative and make the students aware that knowledge is a collective endeavor, which of course is a day. So we, just, we, we, we have lost track of that fact that it's a collective endeavor and we end up doing it quite competitive. It's really, really profound. And she believes that this would turn the whole process of learning into a more equitable endeavor, making students embrace the subject wholeheartedly. So uh, this would become more imaginative. Uh, we give them kind of feeling uh, to the learners, she remarks. So I think very really profound. And I'm really thankful to Dr. Sujata Ramdurai, who spends significant part of the year in Canada, uh, for being here now and accepting our invitation to give the Founders Day lecture today. So I invite her to present the lecture.
Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Professor Anapurni, for the kind words and introduction. Um, what we've been struck by, you have all these institutes in India. I substantial part of my academic life was spent in TIFR. For those of you who have been to TIFR, you know that it's an oasis at the end of Bangalore. So coming here from the Hazil and Basil of Bangalore again reminded me of those days. I mean. You know, we are really lucky and I hope IIA can hold on to this precious piece uh, <laughs> and continue to inspire generations of students and do all the great work that you've been doing here. So when uh, I got this message from Anakuni asking me if I could give this talk on this day talk and uh, asked me for a typing and abstract, then it took me to my old college days because when I was doing mathematics in St. Joseph's College, we used to learn astronomy. And now, sadly, that seems to have disappeared. And again, I think we should, you know, when people start learning trigonometry, I think one of the things that should be taught to them along with it, there should be a field work day where they go see the telescopes, see the stars, and then realize that all this math plays a very important role in all that. You know, that will change their attitude to learning mathematics. And again, you know, they, they can even come to this place here and see that telescopes are actually made. So I did a little bit of reading. I knew the name Vainu Bapu and I knew that IAA was here. And when I was in Tiafa, that's when the Ladakh Observatory was being built. Ramnath uh, who was a good friend. He was very excited at that time. And so I knew. And then, of course, periodically, I keep looking at the NASA website, especially after the James Webb Telescope has gone, gone up. And I thought I'll make this a talk, trying to trace the evolution of telescope technology, if I might call it that from Vaino Bapu's times to this time of the James Webb Telescope and see how much mathematics goes into it. But then it turned out to be a very daunting task because, and in fact, I couldn't find that so much. Uh, it was more about the lenses and the physics and so on and so forth, what I could learn from the internet. And so then I decided to slightly change track and just look at the timeline. So this was 72, so you celebrated 50 years last year. And then there have been various other recent, uh, once the James Webb Telescope was just sent recently. And I thought I would track along the timeline, you know, what's happened in mathematics and how much of that has been related to astronomy. So and we'll start as always with a little bit of history. And of course, all this you know, this is these are the major discoveries by Vainu Bapu. Now, astronomy itself. This has been a very ancient science, different civilizations. You know, that was the first, probably the first science which was, which involved observations outside of your immediate surroundings. And one of the first natural sciences, and I find it very interesting that there were very many early civilizations, independent of time and space, which was interested in this and made lots of contributions, Babylonian, Greek, Indian, Mesopotamian. And then, of course, it started with the observation of the sky, sun, moon. And then I said, all right, what must have got them more interested in that? Because that's, again, one of the subjects where you have, you know, evidence from various, you know, it can be mythology, it can be poetry, it can be various works where something happened on this day, the moon was there, that was there, this was an eclipse, blah, blah, blah. You know. So why did they do it so continuously? And then that must have been because they must have noticed the complex pattern but yet with some underlying regularity. And that's again one of the common themes in mathematics. You know, in mathematics, one of the themes which 
or which is why it's called an art, is there are these patterns. And you want to understand why these patterns occur. And when you find a pattern, then it's very interesting. And then today with so many, you know, the computational aspects, you can spot patterns because you have access to so much data, which earlier you couldn't do those with bare hands, the computations. And so that's something common again, that's some common feature with astronomy, because I'm sure you're also we have tons of data now, and then you can sift through that, and that leads you to ask questions and probably for more theories and so on. And then, of course, close connection to religion and philosophy, which many of you might not know. Mathematics is thought of as a very rational subject and so on. But even today, Cambridge University gives a master's degree in mathematics. It's called not called master's of science. It's called a master's in arts or a bachelor's in arts. It's a BA mathematics. And for a very long time, it was closely related to the church. The church would allow study of theology and mathematics. So something here, you know, we don't know, but later I'll come to other quotes and maybe people can understand why there is this connection. So ancient Greece and India, in fact, astronomy was frequently regarded as a branch of mathematics. And this is why I feel that we should go back to that, especially starting with school education. Because I've had schools, school children and also college children, when they come to me, they say, why should we learn about complex numbers? You know, why should we learn trigonometry? What use is it? And then to sort of tell them that, you know, much of the things which you take for granted today would not have been possible without all those advancements in mathematics. But it's difficult to convince them because they don't see the direct connection. So mathematics itself, the root word is mathema, which means what one learns. It's a science of quantity, an abstract science which investigates the concepts of numerical and spatial relations. So then at some point, there was this divergence between, let's say, numbers and geometry, number theory and geometry. And there's an interesting story for this. I don't know if it's true, but it's a nice story that I like to say. It's apocryphal maybe, but still it's a nice story. And the reason apparently the Greeks today we know them for geometry, you know, the axioms, the theorems, everything. Even though, let's say, Pythagoras theorem is named after a Greek uh, scholar, it was known to many other civilizations much, much before Pythagoras. But today, when you think of mathematics, when you think of the rigor, you associate it with the Greeks. And there was a time when this divergence occurred. Before that, the Greeks were interested a lot in numbers. Diophantine equations, for instance, named Diophantine problems are named after Diophantus of Alexandria. And the story is that when Aristotle, you know, Socrates, there were these different schools, when they came across irrational numbers, they were perplexed. And then they had this belief that the universe, there was complete order in the universe. Chaos was not possible. And so they couldn't come to terms with irrational numbers. And in fact, there was a, apparently, you know, the school said, all right, you should not whispering about this outside our small group. Society should not get wind of this because, you know, it can, it can cause anarchy, it can cause chaos. And then there's a story about how when they were on a picnic on a boat around Greece in one of the rivers somewhere, one of them accidentally blurted it out to others and he was pushed into the sea. But then the Indian civilization also came across irrational numbers. You know, typically, for instance, when they had to construct altars where you were offering oblations to the gods, so everything had to be perfect. And so you had to construct the Vedic altars in a particular way, which you know, very precise measurements. And then you naturally came across right angle triangles and measurements. And then you had to measure the hypotenuse if you took a you're constructing with bricks of one meter, one unit meter length or one unit length, then the hypotenuse is already an irrational number. And they were perplexed. There is evidence to say that know that they confronted it, but they, they said, okay, there are so many things we don't understand in the world. This is one of them. So let's proceed without understanding this. So that's a fundamental divergence already in the way we approach knowledge between different civilizations. And this again, these are the common features with astronomy. It's a subject of antiquity and then evidence of mathematical knowledge across time, over time, across cultures and civilizations. And then you also learn when you go to the history of mathematics or history of astronomy, you see that there was some core development, almost core sanguinity, one can say. And it's intrinsically entwined in astronomy. 
And so here I would like to quote Bertrand Russell, the famous mathematician philosopher, who said mystical doctrines as to the relation of time to eternity are also reinforced by pure mathematics. For mathematical objects such as numbers, if real at all, are eternal and not in time. So there's some constant feature and which probably led to this, you know, and again, there is this awe of, and I'm sure when the early civilizations, when they started thinking of astronomy, when they started observing the motion of planets, they must have been awestruck. And, you know, there is this mystery. And in mathematics to this day, when you're doing, when you're a researcher in mathematics, you see this phenomenon and you have to grapple with that mystery. So Galileo used, of course, we all know from the 16th century, he used powerful telescopes as windows to the cosmos. And I always like to think when I read articles about mathematics, the development or evolution of mathematics and the close relation it had to astronomy, I always like to think that mathematical ideas and techniques was like an invisible telescope. It was an abstract idea which contributed a lot to one's understanding of maybe astronomical, uh, I don't know what to say, astronomical the theories, observations, observations, pheno uh, phenomena, and so on. And then later on, so let me focus now, even though I called my, uh, I'm going to focus now, like I said, when I was planning this talk, I wanted, I was hoping to be very ambitious and go from, you know, almost go back in time and then trace it historically. But then I had to cut it down. I said, okay, from Vaidubapu's time to James Webb, let's see. But, you know, that turned out to be daunting. Then I said, okay, in these last 500 years, let's see, like from the advent of telescope, from the time that Galileo started using the telescope. So then, of course, shortly after that, there was uh, Napier's work on algorithms. And Sorry, not algorithms. It should be logarithms. So Napier's work on logarithms. So this is one of the questions, again, that I get asked constantly by students. In fact, I still remember when my daughter was studying in school and you know, she and her friends were discussing logarithms. They were saying, what use is this? And then somebody else, um, one of her friends said, oh, this person who invented it or discovered it had nothing else to do in life. So did this to torture us for the rest of our lives. <laughs> <laughs> but then it was very quickly at that time, given that things were, there was no internet, etc. It was quickly adopted for sophisticated calculations in astronomy. And then Newton's subsequent work on discovering the laws of motion, you know, led to developments in calculus. And we all know that, again, this has happened across cultures and time. We now have evidence to show that the Kerala school of mathematics and astronomy made fundamental contributions to calculus much before the Europeans even got to think about it. And again, part of this, again, we have evidence to, sh to know that, you know, people studied uh, one of the applications of calculus was in astronomy, in making, you know, precise calculations, rate of change, rate of speed, those kind of things. And, um, you know, we had different almanacs and calendars, and then again, you see the connection, you know, you have many of the calendars, especially in the oriental uh, part of the world, to base, base 60. And of course, formally today in mathematics, we all only know base 10 because of the decimal system. And formally, children are today even taught what it means to work with an arbitrary base. But then, base 60 played a fundamental role in astronomy. And you have the 60 year cycle to this day in the Tamil calendar. For instance, my mother in law who passed away a few years back, when I she would, she could never remember which year she was born in. So if you asked her, a, age or any of somebody's age, she would say, oh, they were born in, she remembered the name of the year. And then she knew that one cycle of 60 had passed. And then she would say, what is the name of this current year? And do the calculation from that. You know, so it was somehow part of it. And that's where, again, you know, again, I have this objection when people say rote learning is bad. Now, it's not completely bad. You know, there are some things, some parts of rote learning which can be useful. After all, we wouldn't have remembered so much if it were not for the 60 years of calendar. And she could retire, if, you know, she was past 90 when she passed away. But she could recite the 60 years like this. And later on, after Newton's work, of course, from 18th century onwards, there was algebra. You know, so this is, let's say, um, 
Germany was, Europe played a very important role in the development of algebra. This was mainly a language which aided in representation of geometric quantities through a, what we know today as algebraic formalism. And then it rapidly found other applications in other branches of science. So for instance, in Göttingen in Germany, at that time, um, there was that was a fundamental place where physics and mathematics was coming together. And Eni Neuter, who's considered the mother of modern algebra, she was there, she had great trouble getting in a place in an academic university because universities were not open to women at that time. And Hilbert, who was the leading mathematician of that time, was in Göttingen. And he had various theories, purely mathematical theories. You know, he was making precise uh, in algebraic language. And this led to various questions and so on. And Eni Neuter had a great grasp of that. And Einstein's theory of relativity had just come out then. And there were some parts of his theory, general relativity and special relativity, where you could see the connection to physics. But he couldn't make that precise, and he couldn't reconcile what appeared as contradictions within. And because Emmy Neuter was his mentee, mentor, and she pointed out the correct mathematical language in which this should be framed. And to this day, there is Neuter's theorem, which is called the most beautiful theorem in ever proved, which interlinks, you know, symmetries and in in a, a mathematical context and which led to the larger framework in which relativity, especially general and special relativity, should be phrased. And then, of course, we know that Einstein's work led to various development in various branches of physics. And um, sure, you know, relativity, for instance, you know, led to space-time and then led to curvature, understanding curvature. And meanwhile, there were developments in mathematics, which appeared independently, you know, and that's one key feature of mathematics. You don't do mathematics just because you think that, you know, it's going to be applied somewhere. You do it, but independently when there are questions from elsewhere, you solve it and then you give the language. And my favorite example in all this is again prime numbers. You know, we have evidence to show that there were different civilization, civilizations which thought of prime numbers almost 5,000 years back. Now, why did they do that? Because they must have been struck by these special class of numbers, you know, which appeared, which had this unique property and so on. And today we know that you cannot do internet banking. There would be no internet security without understanding prime numbers. Because that's the key for using, and the most powerful computer in case people didn't know today, your mobile phone today can multiply two numbers with millions of digits. But if you give a very huge number to the most powerful computer in the world, it still cannot find a factor. It still cannot find a prime factor. And, but then if you know, but there are mathematical tools which develop purely from theoretical aspects of mathematics, which tell you how you can possibly find a prime factor. And then of course, there's this other question. If you're given a very large number, how do you find out if it's a prime number? No, so there are, independent mathematical theories, which developed on their own, without ever imagining that one day there would be in the internet, there would be internet banking, you would need internet security, and so on. Similarly, for quantum computing or quantum uh, computers, the mathematical theoretical foundations go to mathematics, which was done a long time ago. But coming to connections with astronomy, these are the phrases, or these are the areas in pure mathematics, which naturally find applications. Tensor calculus, dynamical systems, spherical geometry, differential geometry, for instance, to understand the curvature and to give even give a mathematical, I mean, you can say curvature of space time, but if you want to work with it, you need to give it a mathematical meaning. You need to phrase it in the language of mathematics. And then, of course, that's where algebraic geometry played a crucial role. And here I would like to pause and come back to Ayu Bapu. Okay, before this, we'll let's pause at algebraic geometry. Because Vainu Bapu was around 1972. So it was around that time, you must have heard of these two famous mathematicians from India, Ms. Narsimhan and C.S. Seshadri. They proved some fundamental theorems in algebraic geometry, which I don't even want to say the statement. It's, uh, it's abstract algebraic geometry. But we know later it has had profound connections with physics, with theoretical physics, and later to string theory. So that is the timeline, you know. So at that time when Vainu Bapu's telescope was being constructed, was constructed and installed, 
you know, there were these fundamental contributions which are happening in theoretical mathematics, which later would go to have very strong uh, applications in theoretical physics, in string theory, and so on. And now let's come to James Webb Space Telescope. In fact, I was telling Professor Anapuri that what you should do once your new website is up is you should have, you should put pictures from all the telescopes, you know, images from all the telescopes. Because whenever I'm working and I get a little depressed by reading the news or something like that, I go to the NASA website and look at all the latest James Webb Telescope images. And it's funny. And so uh, I was looking, in fact, I wanted to put an image of the Uranus rings as captured by the observatory uh, associated with Vainagoku, but I couldn't find them. It would be great if you could put those images. Now, James Webb Space Telescope, 50 years after Vainagoku, so it was 2022, it was last year. And then specifically designed to conduct infrared astronomy. These are personal learnings. I'm sure all of you know all this, but... I learned this. Uh, and then it asks, you know, one of its men, I mean, it seeks to answer for fundamental questions. How did we get here? How does the universe work? Today we know that there are a lot of connections between pure mathematics and trying to explain how the universe works. Singularities, black holes, you know, Einstein's theory of relativity already there, you're using a little bit of uh, differential geometry, quite a bit actually. And then before that symmetries, I mentioned any Noether. If it wasn't for any Noether, that work, uh, Noether's theorem and so on, they led to rapid advances in trying to understand general relativity, special relativity, relativity, what are the kinds of predictions it makes and so on. So for instance, people call God's uh, particle, right? The boson, which was discovered a few years ago and for which uh, there was a Nobel Prize, which is awarded, Higgs. Higgs was really a mathematician at heart. And the Higgs boson, you can relate it to a mathematical quantity. You know, there's mathematics which predicts the existence of Higgs boson. So there's a huge part of Higgs, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, mathematics underlying the story of Higgs boson. And that story is tried to Narsimhan and Seshadri's work on vector bundles over curves. There are special vector bundles, whatever they are, they are objects which you study abstractly. And among those vector bundles, there are special classes called Higgs bundles. And then it's through studying those Higgs bundles and trying to see the connections with theoretical physics that you realize, oh, if this is happening in mathematics, then there must be a corresponding avatar in physics, and that must be the Higgs boson. You know, so the mathematicians predicted the existence of Higgs boson theoretically. And then, of course, later we have to be, I always like to tell people that mathematicians are never, you know, I mean, they're not recognized so much because we don't ask for so much money. We just need a pencil and paper and some books. Whereas to actually find the Higgs boson, you have to spend millions of dollars. <laughs> so study horizons of other words. In mathematics, we just call it singularities. In algebraic geometry, that's again a subject which has been studied you know, almost from the, in fact, if you really go back, it goes back to early when you're studying algebraic expressions, then you can understand singularities by algebra, you can understand them by a geometry, you can understand them today in the combination of those two in algebraic geometry. You know, a simple example to give you about uh, So for instance, you take a circle, a circle, everything is smooth, right? We all immediately understand what it means to be smooth. So something like this is smooth. Because you take any point and then look at a neighborhood, it's the same. There's some kind of homogeneity. But a singularity, this point would be a singularity. This point is a singularity. And as mathematicians, we give them precise meanings. What it means for something to be singular in geometry. So then what is a singularity in space-time? And that's related to your black holes, what happens in, you know, the theory prediction about what happens uh, at the event horizon of a black hole and so on. There's a lot of pure mathematics in that, which was done for the last two or three centuries. So again, I want to, these were the questions and I say that, you know, the interface of theoretical physics and pure mathematics, this provides the right language to frame these questions and also construct theories or explore theories which might lead to answers for these questions.
So here is an image, like I said, I often like looking periodically, I keep looking at the images posted by the James Webb Telescope. So this is the timeline. So 72, when um, Vaidya Bapu's observatory was built, that was when there were these fundamental advances made in mathematics or vector bundles on curves, which later found, you know, people from all over the world working on it. They constructed these Higgs bundles, related on the theoretical physics side to the prediction of Higgs boson, which was discovered. Then it has connections to gravitational waves. So all of this language and discourse happens in the language of algebraic geometry, a huge component of mathematics enters there. And therefore, I like to say, when I look back, look at the history and look at the developments, there's almost a cosmic connection between math and astronomy. And uh, I would, you know, I came across these two uh, articles, the 100 Years of Mathematical Cosmology, Models, Theories, and Problems. And I found that, you know, there's a timeline, they call the first period of cosmology, second period, third period. And there are a lot of words which make sense to me because they're pure mathematics. And uh, then they also talk of the future of mathematical cosmology. So these are the links to the two articles. It appeared in the Philosophical Transactions of the Cambridge Mathematical Society. So I'm, maybe all of you already know about it. But in case you don't, then uh, I found it exciting along my preparation for this talk. And so that's again, I felt there is a case to be made for deeper integration of mathematics and astronomy. Not just at a very late stage, I know, you know, I tried to find out what are the prerequisites for a course in astrophysics. I couldn't find too many places in India which offers astrophysics. But there were other universities, Cambridge, Australia, I think some universities, Europe, there were some universities. And almost all of them mentioned uh, mathematics, physics, you know, these were the prerequisites. And then interestingly, when I just Googled um, courses in astrophysics, then there were a lot of people asking questions on math stack exchanges. So when I've done a PhD in mathematics, I would like to shift to astronomy or the other way around. I have done a PhD in astrophysics. I would like to shift to pure mathematics. <laughs> so there are people who want to do that. And so there should be a nice pathway integrating these two. Now, number theory, which is touching upon one of the areas of my research. This has been very interesting in the last, I would say, 15 years, number theory makes a surprising entry. So one of them is random matrix theory, which is used in number theory, but the original way random matrix theory developed was because there were ideas and techniques connecting nuclear physics and number theory. So random matrix theory must have must be around 20 years, I think, 20 years. And people are hoping that there are some fundamental problems in mathematics, which are over 1000 years, which are very deep problems in number theory. I cannot uh, explain those problems, but very abstract and so on. And people are somehow using random matrix theory to make advances in that. And there are some who feel that, you know, if we understand this deeply enough and use techniques from random matrix theory, we should crack this problem. And random matrix theory apparently also plays a role in cosmology. Don't, don't ask me how, but that was what I learned uh, uh, along the way. But number theory and physics, especially theoretical physics, and if you go back to that previous slide and look at these two articles, you know, they make some of the, uh, the correct uh, noises about how number theory is entering cosmology. So for instance, there are brain words, I don't know, brains, if you have heard of brains and so on. So again, all this is coming from mathematics, which was done 100 years back. You know, K-theory, M-theory, these are the ones that are being used in string theory in an effort to understand how the universe works or to explain the cosmos. And so there are intriguing segues, you know, you seem to be able to segue from number theory to ma mathematics and then string theory in theoretical physics to quantum field theory and then to cosmology. That was my understanding of sort of uh, gleaning through those two articles. And then what are the words from number theory which play a role? So these, there are some objects called L functions in number theory. So which occur in a variety, I mean, the simplest L function would be the Riemann zeta function. Most of you have, you have heard about it. It's a function of a complex variable. Where do they 
this is a complex variable. This is definite series. So we know, oops. It's an infinite series, but we know that it also has an infinite product expansion. I've written it as an infinite series. So then, of course, you ask about area of convergence. Where does it converge? But then it also has this interesting um, avatar where you write it as a product, infinite product. You write it as 1 minus 1 over p to the power s, you know, where p is related to the primes and so on. So it has a different avatar, and there are lots of questions about what is its area of convergence, when does it acquire a zero, and then what are the values of this v1 zeta function, and so on. So these multiple zeta values are glorified avatars of these L functions. L functions by themselves are mysterious. So for instance, v1 hypothesis, that's an open problem. There are, you know, um, around the turn of this millennium, 2000, there were a series of problems which are called the millennial problems. Anybody who solves this problem will get a million dollars. So the, the problems related to L functions and the Riemann zeta functions are in that list. And then zeta values are even more complicated. But then you understand some of the zeta values and then they naturally turn out apparently to be related to constants that come up in theoretical physics. And in the study of cosmological constants or whatever. I'm not an expert on those, but so you suddenly have the physicists very interested in understanding, you know, brains, which is mathematical, and also these parts, then uh, zeta values, the number theory and connections between number theory and physics. So you can just Google connections between number theory and physics and that will throw up a lot of interesting connections. So then, so that led me back to, you know, Martin Rees, this famous astronomer who made this comment. The universe is still a place of mystery and wonder. He's known, very well known for his quotes. But then I was struck by his second quote. If we ever establish contact with intelligent aliens living on a planet around a distant star, they would be made of similar atoms to us. They could trace their origins back to the Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago, and they would share with us the universe's future. However, the surest common culture would be mathematics. I found this very striking. And so since given all these connections, emerging connections between number theory and physics and possibly cosmology, took me back to Euclid, third century BC, who proved the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Every positive number can be expressed uniquely as a product of primes. Right? That's Euclid's theorem. It's called the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. And then later, of course, now you use that Fundamental theorem forms the basis of internet cryptography as we know it today. And then I discovered that the European Space Agency had sent this Euclid telescope. And that's one of the images from the Euclid telescope. So perhaps it's fitting. You know, so these connections from Mainu Bapu to um, James Webb telescope, where I try to give some understanding of the developments of mathematics in this timeline, but it goes back to number theory again, and to the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, which started in third century. You know. So it must go back even further. And this was a fascinating exploration for me. And I do hope that there are more courses and more places like this, which integrates the two subjects so that we really advance in knowledge, both in mathematics as well as astronomy. Thank you very much. As well. Thank you, Professor Ramdoran. It was a very lucid talk, and uh, I'm sad that it ended. <laughs> so, uh, actually, as a token of appreciation, um, I think we have arranged for a very apt uh, gift for you because you are the first astronomer who likes to, uh, first mathematician who likes to look at uh, images, the astronomical images. So I would now uh, request Professor Annapuni Subramanian to uh, gift you the.
Thank you. Uh, so ma'am, if you don't mind, uh, shall we open the floor for a few questions? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, does anybody have any questions from the uh, audience? Okay, yeah, yeah, Prabha. Uh, thank you for a very nice talk. So, uh, so uh, I, I just wanted to mention, uh, ask your opinion uh, about uh, this uh, the probability theory, which is extremely crucial for studying this model, yeah. not just for studying um, errors and so on, but for the very nature of the uh, fluctuation of matter to describe that probability is a uh, random field is the most important uh, mathematical situation. So, so from the analysis point of view, uh, I, I believe that so it, it is now an uh, important thing to combine probability theory with geometry and topology to do the analysis. And um, so I, I try to do a bit of that and I find that uh, there are actually many gaps in the mathematical side which need to be like guaranteed to be true. So I just wanted your perspective on how the subject is important. Oh, that's great. So, well, I'm not an expert. Like I said, all this was reading that I tried out. I know that there are these connections. Now, uh, in fact, I wanted to mention that as well. Those are the other areas, you know, probability, statistical mechanics also probably have plays an important role, statistical analysis, all of these. I know that these are used, for instance, very effectively in other areas where you have large data and also to understand images. So, for instance, I learned that this is a true story, this, and I like to repeat it everywhere, just to prove the power of mathematics. You know. So, you have these MRI machines. Now, at the heart of the MRI machines, it's just mathematics because it tells you how do you relate an image to where it came from. You know, and in fact, people don't know it, but there's a famous story about the MRI machine, and this also tells how you, how naive the mathematicians are. So the story apparently is that uh, in the I think it was Harvard or Princeton, one of these I fancy Ivy League colleges. The mathematicians and the physicists were at lunch together, and the mathematicians were super excited. And then the physicist said, Oh, we've never seen you guys so excited. You're always very quiet. So, why are you so excited? He said, You know, today we found out how to, you know, um, predict whether a given image, where it comes from. So, what they were really saying is something related to the linear Fourier transform. So, think of two sets you have a set where you see the image, and you have probably data. And you want to say which image correlates to which data. So you can think of it as a function. And they found out that they can find, they can say which uh, element in one set maps to which, you know. And then the physicists were, they immediately translated this. And then they asked, okay, can two different data sets have the same image? And does every image have to come from some data set and so on? And the mathematician said, oh, we don't care about all that. Right now, we have found out how to say when an image comes from a data set. Then the physicist ran with the idea and built the MRI machine. <laughs> you know, because at the heart of the magnetic resonance imaging is the Fourier transform. Right? So today, and then what happened, uh, this was a few years back, I was in a very interesting talk, which was called from the bedside to the, no, from the bedside to the blackboard. So you have these MRI machines, and then, you know, just, let's say there's a very young child whose brain needs to be imaged. And then you can't keep the child in without immobile for a very long time, so you have to sedate the child. So you wouldn't want to do that to newborns and very young children and so on. So every MRI machine which improves the time by, let's say, a few seconds costs a few hundred thousand dollars more or half a million dollars more. Then the probabilists came out with this great idea. They said, you know, we'll try out an algorithm, keep the child for a short time, but we will take many, many, many more images than what you do in a usual MRI machine. And then they use that to extrapolate 
And then actual comparison showed that this theory and the algorithm worked much better than a real machine which cost half a million dollars. So there are people who do these things, you know, that's the interface of dynamical systems, probability, statistics, and so on. So there are people, and you know, if you have the precise questions, I'm sure there will be people who know, who can guide you. But I think this is where the crosstalk is missing. You know, it's exactly like this story where the mathematicians were excited because they found how to figure out what goes where. And then the physicists ran with the idea, saw that this could actually be translated to a resonance, uh, you know, to imaging. So, and again, mathematics in the last few years and theoretical physics have play, played that role. You know, there are questions theoretical physics uh, physicists ask, and then once the mathematicians understand the language, they say, oh, but this we know. And then tell them what. And then there was a period when it went the other way around. The theoretical physicists would come and say, look, our theory is predict this. Is this consistent with your mathematics? Right? So something like that is happening, as far as I know, with these areas, cosmology, string theory, quantum field theory, and mathematics. So if there were more people pulled into this, you know, by astrophysicists who could phrase the questions, I'm sure that would be interesting crosstalk. Yeah, it was. I was intrigued by your mention of the use of number theory in nuclear physics. Uh, the use of, uh, no, not not in nuclear like physics. Not in nuclear physics. So it's a. I mentioned this random matrix theory. Yeah. That's really you know it's complicated. You it uses linear algebra. It uses statistics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then there are open conjectures in number theory, thousand-year-old problems, and also these millennial problems, and so on. And people feel that using a random matrix theory which originally came up because there were ideas from tech and techniques from uh, that was being used in nuclear physics, as far as I understand. And then people in number theory who were studying these problems found that the techniques from random matrix theory could probably help advance our understanding of these conjectures. But again, then a lot of probability and statistics comes in as well. So let me give you a simple example. For instance, in mathematics, typically there might be a problem saying, um, you know, which involves prime numbers. You know, you know something happens for a, a prime number, or you conjecture that something should happen for a prime number. But then verifying it, because you know there are infinitely many primes, verifying that conjecture, and you're not able to prove it for all prime numbers, whereas mathematicians aim for perfection. If you make a conjecture, you would like to prove it for in as much generality as possible. But maybe you can check the conjecture by hand for prime p equals 2, p equals 3, small prime. But as the primes get larger, it's going to be a defeating task. Even today with advanced computing, you can do more computations and check that this happens. But then there is this other, you know, it's called uh, um, statistical something, statistical mathematics, I think. No, no, it's not statistical. It's called just statistics, yeah, um, enumerator statistics. So what you do is you find the probability for which, for the number of primes for which your conjecture is going to be true. You know, you can take all the primes and then you have a quantified way of quantifying rather than saying all primes. Then the next best thing would be to say for all but finitely many primes. And then in mathematics, there's a word density, you know. So you measure the density of primes for which your statement is true. And there are a lot of statistics and statistical phenomena coming, probability, those kind of things. And random matrix theory, from my understanding, uses tools and techniques and combines them effectively. Very good question. Huh. So, uh, if there are no more questions from people here, then we will go to this online question. Uh, so, yeah, oh, group, how group theory is group useful theory. to astronomy. <laughs> I must say my knowledge of astronomy is very, uh, I know that group theory, again, this is from my limited reading of those two papers that I mentioned. I mean, group theory plays a role in symmetry, right? After all, that was one of the reasons that they found the first connections between group theory and physics. And then later, for instance, string theorists use uh, basic group theory. But now I think, you know, it's, uh, one intriguing thing again, which I found, which I, I know that this is true on the mathematical side, you have these very esoteric objects 
is called modular forms, whatever they are. But they have been studied for over three, four hundred years. And Ramanujan, for instance, Srinivasa Ramanujan was one of the pioneers in the study of modular forms and so on. And then again, with those modular forms, there are these numbers that come out. And some of these modular forms have connections. I have I don't know the real uh, story, but they are connected to um, various cosmological phenomena and theoretical physics. So number theory and physics, for instance, the connection, there's a big role played by modular forms. And then, again, group theory comes in, but in a very convoluted way, because you know that you can assemble all uh, modular forms of a given, uh, you know, of a given weight, say, uh, you know, they have various invariants associated to modular forms, so you try to assemble them. And, and then when you assemble them, they form a group. They, they, you find that that set of modular forms has more structure. It has, you know, it can have a linear space, vector space structure, so therefore it also has a group structure, and so people can use that. But I'm sorry, my competence is at uh, that level. Yeah. Okay, Arun and then Amusha. Yeah, Arun, please. One of the direct connections between uh, mathematics and astronomy is the, as you said, the birth of calculus and solving the Kepler problem, etc. Nowadays, uh, you know, the, the, the mathematics anticipated the solution of uh, GR and the Einstein equation, so that solution came up, was actually happily introduced when Riemann, uh, Riemann's geometry was yeah. introduced. But the language of classical mechanics, which is sort of the fundamental uh, theory for the whole physics, right? I think sort of the growth in that field is, is essentially mathematics. Yes, uh, yes. You know, Lagrange, Hamiltonian, right. so that provided such a rich mathematical structure. So, uh, would you think that there are new recent developments that in this in this area of classical mechanics? mechanics? I don't know classical mechanics. I think somehow the feeling is that been there, done that. You know, yes. Everything yes. that's need, that needs to be known is already known. Uh, but I don't know. You can you know so when I see some very recent literature, you know, in the context of solution of black hole. Orbits and various things. There are new concepts that are still uh, waiting to be discovered. Yeah, I don't know. It's a very interesting question, and uh, I think that's also one of the strengths of mathematics because, like I said, we still use the theorem of Euclid. It has a much longer shelf life. So I'm hoping mathematics has a much longer shelf life. So I'm hoping that all these new developments will help mathematicians to revisit because you know there are mathematicians. For instance, there's this theorem called the prime number theorem. Right, which sort of says take any real number, then you want to measure that you know that there are infinitely many prime numbers. But if you take any real number, you want to measure the number of primes, you want to quantify the number of prime numbers which is less than or equal to that number. Now that's called the prime number theorem. You have an exact for, exact formula for that. And that was, you know, Riemann proved it, Gauss played an important role in proving it. And today there are, you know. Mathematicians can sort of recite the proof, how that was proved, and then what was the advancement in the next proof, how a new way of thinking about that problem led to that proof, and so on. So mathematicians from that way are still very open, you know. So if they spot something and say, hey, this tool can be used to give a different proof of the Riemann, uh, of the prime number theorem, they won't let it go. They won't say, oh, we have 10 proofs of uh, prime number theorem, why should we have one more? You know, so maybe, therefore, since... Uh, <laughs> Given that, but who knows? Chat GPT might throw us all out of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Uh, a very uh, insightful talk. Thank you for that. And for the group theory connection, I think we have a lot of applications in particle physics. Okay. I'm not a particle physicist, but I uh, studied group theory in my MSc. I'm a, uh, from MSc mathematics, and I was searching for applications in astronomy. And this is how, uh, I mean, I came to know that particle physics, if at all, I have to apply the group theory, ring theory, and twin theory that I study in my MSc, I have to do uh, particle physics problems sometimes in my life. And another field of application is numerical analysis. Oh, yes. A lot of numerics we do is, uh, like, without mathematics, we cannot do astronomy because uh, computational simulations, we have to use a lot of numerical analysis. 
thank you. No, we're talking of uh, what you said, you know, group theory and particle physics. So in group theory, for a very long time, there was this open problem. So you call a group a simple group if it has no proper normal subgroups. There's a special subgroups are subsets. Your group is after all a set. And a subgroup is a subset, which is also a group. Normal subgroups are those with special properties. And so you take any group, then you just take the identity element in that group and the whole group. These are two examples of normal subgroups. And then you say that a group is simple if it has no other normal subgroups. And then for a long time, there was a question of how do you classify the finite, and these groups are called simple groups. So you have a fairly good understanding of finite groups. You know, you know various things you can do with finite groups and so on. So, but there was a question about what are the finite simple groups? Can you classify the finite simple groups? And that was classified, um, and then you had precise order, you know, okay, for you, these are the only finite simple groups that can occur. And then later on, people kept discovering errors, something needed to be filled. And then again, surprisingly, these led to groups with huge orders. You know, they are called the monster groups. They had very fine, they were finite groups, but the number of elements in that set were really huge. And then there is this miraculous, fascinating connection between these numbers and modular forms again. You know, monster, moonshine, I don't know if you've heard of all these. And what I learned recently again was again some work done by Ramanujan, which is shows up in this monster uh, uh, groups and moonshine groups and so on. They have a role in theoretical physics, you know, through representation theory. I don't fully understand, but you know, there are always these intriguing connections which suddenly come up. And so again, if you had more crosstalk and chatter, I think it would be more interesting. Uh, can I add a sure, please. So, uh, maybe the simplest uh, way to see how important the theory is is for, for example, she in this system, like when we say photon or graviton, these are just representations of the group. Uh, algebra, yes, yeah, algebra. Mm -hmm. So, it, it is fundamental to, 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 to astronomy also. Also, cosmology, when we do, we use. Uh, Fundamental uh, cosmological principle is just a statement of uh, symmetry, which is nothing but the theory, right? Exactly. But uh, my, uh, I just want to add to what Arun was asking. I don't know if it is related. But um, uh, so recently there was a paper by Frank Buche a few months ago, and uh, he talked about the deformation of solid bodies and how to use the language of uh, vector bundles and so on to classify that and to actually discover new phenomena. So it is at the theoretical level. I don't think it has been applied or I haven't seen any follow-up papers on him also yet. But that seems to be there seems to be still things uh, worth yes. investigating in that direction. Yeah, thanks. That's very I'm learning a lot. But coming back to this, so this takes us back to Narsim and Seshadri, you know, because their fundamental theorem was about you have a group which is a fundamental group of a topological space of a, coming from a curve, from a compact Riemann surface. So what are the representations of that fundamental group? You have a very good understanding. You can relate those to vector bundles. And then special vector bundles, you can relate them to special representations of the fundamental group. So that is Seshadri's theorem, which again was done in total abstraction. And then the Higgs bundles occur as special things and so on. So representation theory plays a big role, and of course, if representation theory plays a big role, groups are not far behind because groups come up in representation theory. Yeah, so I have a very really basic question. Like uh, the video talked about the connection between astronomy and mathematics. So like uh, I mean, when I was in high school, so I was never good at mathematics. I never knew what scientist I is, so still I ended up here. So so I just, I just wanted to know like uh, the the pressure that high school students have, like they have to score good in mathematics. So then I was not that good. 
So, oh, how do you like establish the connection? Because when I encountered the application of trigonometry, that you talk like students should be brought here and they should be spawned in this course and they should be having night sky sessions. So, that they will be uh, doing the application of trigonometry, not the learning scientific or cost design or doing some mathematics. So, how you like, uh, motivate us to motivate our youngsters so that they will just go beyond the numbers? It's not just the numbers, it's the application. Yeah. So, this is uh, thank you for the question. So, this is something I realized, and for the last 10 years or so, uh, I've been trying to do a lot of outreach. And in particular, I've been trying, I mean, this was all before COVID, before online uh, thing became a fashion and so on. I said our students in India don't have access to good resources, whereas technology makes it possible. I don't believe that, you know, just watching videos you can learn. Watching is different from learning. But it can be a good supplement. So I tried to create, and our textbooks are great. Our mathematics textbooks are very good, but the problem is nobody reads them anymore. And then the way it is taught in class, nobody wants to learn. They disengage from mathematics. And a key to learning any subject is to engage. Like when I was preparing for this talk, I really felt I should understand more about telescope. What's the physics? Though I was never fond of physics. But then what is this inch, this 40 inch telescope that uh, GMRT I know had, uh, you know, it was a short wavelength telescope, something, something. So what is all that? I wanted to understand that. So once you spark the curiosity in a child, then the child wants to understand. But then, like you say, there's so much pressure about numbers. It, uh, and today, I think you can use technology meaningfully in the classroom. But unfortunately, it's not being used many meaningfully. It's just videos and nobody learns from videos. So I try to create presentations of every chapter in the textbook for high school. And, you know, because again, students don't need and whether we like it or not, that's the future of learning. They are going to engage differently with media. Yeah. And so just make presentations which amplifies what is there in the textbook. And I have this idea of after every chapter, there should be a link where they can read more about why they are learning this or what else can they do with what they have learned. They can watch a video then, you know, which says why are logarithms important. And I got in, you know, there's another, uh, there's a space science, uh, the Nikita, I don't know if you people know of Nikita. So she, you know, right? Okay. So she runs a startup for space science education among the underprivileged and privileged and so on. So I said, why don't you do me a favor? Because everybody asks me, what's the use of negative numbers? What's the use of complex numbers? What's the use of mathematics? So I said, just make a small presentation for me. Which Because be, and when you talk to high school students, everybody wants to be uh, an astronaut, <laughs> right? So tell them to make them understand that a rocket cannot go into a space and therefore they cannot be an astronaut if there was no mathematics. Then it immediately changes the way they engage with the subject. So I think these are, I mean, I'm not saying this is the perfect solution, but the problem is so huge. There's no single silver bullet which will solve the problem, but we should just keep trying. Any other comments? Yeah, Sarah. Yeah, I think the mathematics is hidden from math numbers through programming languages. <laughs> so, there are libraries which use of the mathematics, and then that is being used. So, uh, it, it is hidden from you, it's there. <laughs> no, mathematics is hidden even from mathematicians. <laughs> because of the coding. But it has good benefits. I mean, for instance, when I first went to, I mean, I think we are at a very interesting time. You know, at, at no time did you have so many tools accessible wherever you were. So, but it needs creativity and imagination to see how to bring them together and make everybody try. So, for instance, um, uh, when I first moved to British Columbia and I went to Canada, and I was teaching the way I was teaching in India, I never, of course, taught in India. I only taught PhD students or master's students, and there I was teaching undergraduate calculus and all that. And then I realized that, you know, whenever I would write an equation, coordinate geometry and say, this is a point there, the students would be very surprised. Because how do you know that? So then I had to tell them that you have to substitute and then because they satisfy that equation, whereas they never realized that connection. Why? Because they all had a graph calculator. So the minute they saw an equation, they would graph it. Whereas I 
don't struggle when I saw a parabola, I had to stop my lecture and think for a minute, okay, which direction is the vertex, which direction is it opening out and so on. Whereas they, because I used the graph calculator all their life, the minute I wrote an equation and I drew the wrong the curve, they would immediately tell me. And then what I would do is actually plot a few points and then graph it. But they never knew that method of graphing. They only knew how to use a calculator. So you see, whereas if you use, if you let the students half the semester, you're allowed to use graph calculators. But before that, you have to learn the theory behind the graph calculation. And it is possible. So, but like I said, mathematics is either even for mathematicians today because you just use a computer program. Whereas when uh, Riemann or Gauss, when they proved the prime number theorem, when they had the formula, when they, you know, conjectured the formula for the number of primes less than a real number, there was not even a calculator. Right? So, we are in, an, we are in interesting times, depends on how we harness them. Yeah, actually, most codes in astronomy are open source, so you should get into the code and get your hands <laughs> right. That's the way to bring out the hidden math. I'm writing code, so I'm applying mathematics. Yeah, because uh, following up on what you just said, I was wondering what is your attitude towards the uh, extreme use of numerical programming, etc. And its application, for example, to mathematics. No, again, I, I, I'm a believer. This is like saying, you know, why should somebody learn to write? Because today everybody types, or very soon you will have a computer where you can speak and it will. But I'm a believer. I think, you know, humanity came this far only through that path. And similarly, why should we learn multiplication tables? Because your calculator can do it. There is something about the human brain which, when you engage, you know, in these classical forms, then the learning is deeper. And so I think there should be a mix of, but on the other hand, I don't want to throw away these computers because they are very useful. The amount of data they generate helps you look at patterns, advanced theories, and so on. So use it as a tool, but granted the status of our eminent tool, you know, that would be my... Because these days it's more common in astrophysics to find numerical solutions of complex equations which are all related to each other. Yeah. Whereas what we really would have liked for the application have to ask the solutions for that. Yeah. In fact, that's something else I forgot to mention, you know, uh, uh, partial and linear differential equations, the role that they pay, play in astrophysics, not just in astrophysics, but in any real life situation. And also again you are living in a interesting times because you know there's this whole data science that coming up that's coming up. I mean, data science, you know, there's this abstract thing. I don't know if people here are aware of categories, you know, which are very abstract. You know, you start with set, set theory, right? Categories are super, super abstract, then, uh, but they are very useful in mathematics as a language, as a tool. And then these categories, which were done over 100 years back, you know, you had all, have all this abstract. It's in fact, even in mathematics, it's called abstract nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's developed, it's overdeveloped to a great extent. And today it turns out to be a very convenient tool for expressing various advancements in mathematics, in physics, and so on. And then miraculously, it seems to be the perfect language to understand advanced data sets. Right? So there are these connections. So again, simulation, modeling, all of this will play a huge role. And you can use the power of machines, but that power of machines by themselves are not going to be enough. You need human ingenuity, creativity, and insights. But the two of them combined together, I think, you know, you are at the cusp of that transformation. Yeah. So. So you been since you like pictures, you also want to look at art. Thank you all. So it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you.